Good morning, my friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. And I'm so glad that you are here today. I believe God's Word is really going to enrich your spirit. And the things that we're talking about today will help you to um, maybe revisit some areas that you thought you just couldn't go any further. Maybe you were even told by experts Uh, that this can't be done, or that you can't go into this area, or or whatever it might be, I want to share some things that will reshape your thinking, and I believe will also greatly bolster your faith. Let's talk about those today, but first, let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we go into your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit will turn on the light, that we can see things from a new perspective, that we can see that there's always hope and that there's always a way forward with you, even if it would appear that we're stuck. We thank you that you can show us the way to go ahead, how to get out. Now, Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I believe that as we cover this material today, I believe solutions and answers are going to come to you. And that is a product of the Word of God, working in your life, enriching your spirit. Praise the Lord. Now, let's begin today in the book of 1 John chapter 5, and as we're getting closer and closer to the return of the Lord, uh, which is the last, or we could say the end of the days of, you know, the, the, the work of God is going to come to a culmination where the great harvest will be reaped, praise the Lord, and then the end will come for us. Now, there will be a great tribulation period, and there will be great judgments in the earth, but I believe that we will be with the Lord during that time. But as we continue to venture further and further into the end times, we will also begin to realize the emphasis of the Holy Spirit upon the end books in the Bible, which would be 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also uh, the book of Revelation. Praise God, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So today, we are in 1st John chapter 5, and I want us to look particularly at verse 4. And it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Now, I think that when we look at this verse, we automatically attribute it to the believer. And that that would be accurate in a sense that if you're a child of God, there is the God nature in you to overcome. But I believe that you could also, because we see the word whatever, you could also say that anything that God gives birth to has that same world overcoming ability. Let's say that God calls you to start a business and he gives you the idea and he gives you the the energy and the ability to work it. Well, I believe that that business, because it is ordained of God, it is birthed by God and he's going to birth that through you. I believe that if you do it right, that business can be around to greet Jesus when he comes back to take you home with him. The same way with the ministry. If the Lord births the ministry, then it's very likely that that ministry, even if the founder dies, but yet the ministry was birthed by God, that ministry will be around when Jesus comes back. Woo, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, you don't go into ministry just because you have money. I have seen that often. Maybe a, a person really loves God, and uh, they maybe they had an accident, and then they got a payout by an insurance company, and they think, I'm going to go in, into the ministry because I can quit my job and go into the ministry. Well, you don't go into the ministry just because you have financial freedom. <laughs> you go into the ministry because of uh, there's a calling, And if you appoint yourself and you go in, maybe because you have the money and uh, you could, you know, like work some things up or stuff like that, uh, you still won't have the supernatural equipment that must accompany any minister that's called into a full-time ministry. So while it's great, I'm sure, to have 
like financial independence, that's not a basis for judging whether or not you should go into the ministry. And I've heard a lot of people say that, well, when I retire, I'm going to go into the ministry as, as if God's uh, got to work within a certain boundaries. And uh, no, when God calls you, that's when you go, regardless of what's going on, whether you're highly successful or maybe, maybe you're just working your way forward. But when God called me into the ministry full time, I was working a salary job, 48 hours a week, plus preaching on weekends and you'll, you know, going to any open door of the minister. But when he called me into the full-time ministry at that time, I only had three meetings on the schedule. And there had been other times I had a whole bunch of meetings lined up and I would just work my way through them. But when he actually called me, would uh, uh, it wouldn't seem like it would make any sense financially. And in people's thinking, they think, well, uh, we'll go into the ministry where we have a bunch of money. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. And God doesn't need to have those things in a person's life lined up. When God calls, he will provide. But again, whatever is born of God overcomes uh, anything and everything the world can throw at it. And that could be a ministry. That could be a business. Uh, it also would pertain to the believer, him or herself. Praise God. So there are works of God that have been established by God that are still around, even if the original founder passed away uh, 100 or 200 years ago, that work continues on. Why? Because it was born of God. Whatever, not just whoever, but whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And sometimes people do fail because they're trying to do too much. They take on too many things, and they never really uh, get their feet and their hands fully into the singular individual thing that God called them to do. And uh, they do all of this stuff, and before they know it, they're distracted. But my friends, when you've got that one main thing, which could replicate and could multiply in many ways where it even goes around the world. But whatever that is, is where you should give your focus because if something is born of God, it will minister to your generation and very often will continue on to further generations. Now, I, I believe that we are running short in a sense on time. I don't see like generation after generation coming on down the line. Uh, because God is going to quicken the work that he is going to do. Praise God. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Now, this is interesting. The world here would refer to the fallen world system, a world that is under the oppression of sin having entered into the world. And the word here in the Greek is the word uh, cosmos. And while sometimes it can refer to the universe, sometimes this word can refer to the divine order that can be found in creation. Here we see it referring to a fallen world system. And that's why that very nature of decay and corruption that is in the earth because of sin, uh, it can put things up against us, whether it's a roof leak or whether you're going to a meeting to worship the Lord and you have a flat tire. <laughs> now, I know the blessing can override a lot of that, but sometimes, though, just because we live in this world doesn't mean that we can escape maintenance, maintenance on our bodies to take care of ourselves, maintenance on the home, maintenance on the car. So my friends, we overcome whatever it might be, whether it's a flat tire or it's a roof leak, we fix it and we keep on going. Praise the Lord. So this fallen world system has many things that we're up against, and it could be even basic things like the hot weather, uh, I was ministering in Israel one time. Pastor Kelly was there with me, and she doesn't like that real hot heat. Now, I grew up in South Texas, so there is still uh, a part of me that kind of acclimated to that. And, you know, I, looking back on it, it was kind of crazy because when me and my brothers were like in high school and we were running track, we would actually go out and work out 
and it would be like a, you know like 103 degrees and ultra high humidity but after a while you you could even acclimate to that and um but my wife grew up in Southern California, which has pretty much perfect weather year round. And so she didn't see that exposure to real high humidity or even sweltering heat like that. So when we were in Israel, uh, at the early part of the summer one time, whoo, was it ever hot in this outdoor meeting place that we were ministering in on the top of the Mount of Olives. And my goodness, it was sweltering hot. But as tough as it was for me, it was a lot harder for Kelly. And as as tough as it was for Kelly, there were people that were there from Scandinavian countries. There was one lady uh, and some other ladies that were from uh, Norway, and they looked like they were about to melt into the chair. <laughs> and, and very, very uh, much could have fainted or passed out. And the conference host you know, he had some big fans put up, but those fans weren't hitting everybody. And uh, boy, some people were really being very, very strong to uh, persevere. But you know what? Even Solomon, with all of his wisdom and all of the great things that he understood, he never had air conditioning. And so he would have to endure and go through the grueling summers just like any other Israeli. And yes, you can put a roof over you and block the sun out, but it's still hot underneath that roof. And, dur and during the winter, because sometimes even in Jerusalem, it can still snow and get very cold. They didn't have a heating system. They didn't have HVAC like we have. Woo, praise God. They didn't have electricity. As wise as Solomon was, they did not have electricity. So this world system by the very nature that we have earthquakes and storms and uh, hurricanes and drought and stuff like that, it can throw some things at you. But we are told that for whatever, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Everything, the fallen world system with all of its sin, all of this stuff, you can overcome it. You know, uh, when my wife and I were ministering once in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was... Uh, and this was at the church of uh, Pastor Green. And uh, Dr. Green passed away, I think, just a couple of years ago. But when I was ministering at his church, uh, just driving to his church, there were sirens going off all over the city because of a tornado warning. And when we were at the church, uh, the tornado uh, touched down. We were told, or we actually thought in the area, but we could actually hear it going around the church building. And it sounded like a freight train just driving continually around the building that went on for maybe about 10 minutes and it was it was violent but everything was holding together because God was holding it together Dr. Green told me later that uh they called the uh, I can't remember who it is the National Weather Service and the National Weather Service said the tornado was right over the building so when we were hearing it that it was right there so uh, you know, in situations like that, you can't run out, can't go anywhere. So he just rebuked it and then turned the service over to me. And I went up and preached, preached all the way through it. <laughs> that was a really strange service because I told him later, uh, like a year afterwards, when I talked to him on the phone, I said, Dr. Green, that meeting was phenomenal. I said, the way you got up and rebuked that tornado in front of all the congregation. And when you did that, peace came over all the people because some of them were beginning to get into fear. And you could see it on the eyes, on the facial expressions of the people. But I said, Dr. Green, when you did that, peace came over everybody. Everybody settled down. Even though we could hear that noise going on, I said, that was just a tremendous anointing you were under. He said, I did that? I said, yeah. He said, I actually stood up there and rebuked a tornado. I said, yeah. I said, you don't remember? He said, no, I don't remember any of that. And uh, I said, well, it was quite a meeting. He said, well, I, he said, it was certainly a meeting. All right. He said, I remember turning the meeting over to you and you went up there and preached just a little bit. And then when you got done preaching, uh, you went over to the people in wheelchairs and you were pulling people up out of the wheelchairs and they were walking for the first time. I said, I did? He goes, yeah. I said, I did that? I said, I don't even remember that. He said, oh, we do. We certainly remember it. <laughs> it was a very, very 
strange night. Praise the Lord. But my friends, the world, the world system can throw all kinds of crazy things against you, but you have to just keep on going. And there was a woman that was one of my ministry partners, and uh, she actually lived in Tulsa. So although we, we traveled from North Carolina to go to that meeting, uh, she also lived in Moravian Falls and had gone back to Tulsa during that week. And so when she knew that we were there, she just came over and jumped into that meeting. Well, what we found out later is that when she came into the meeting, she literally walked right through a tornado because she came in like maybe like 20 minutes after the service had started. I said, hey, didn't you see all of those sirens? And did, did you see the tornado? She said, I don't I don't even know anything about that, Pastor Stephen. She said, on the way to the meeting, I got so caught up in praising God. I was under such a spirit of praise, shouting and singing to the Lord. I don't, she said, I don't even know how I drove to the meeting. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't even remember driving to the meeting. <laughs> she said, I do think I remember like a bunch of red lights flashing, but she said, I didn't even pay any attention to any of that. Mm -mm. And so, my friends, we see that Whatever or whoever is born of God overcomes the world system. And that could also be viewed as being an antichrist system. You know, if you go to certain restaurants, they'll give you an, a discount immediately if you're a first responder, or maybe if you're a teacher, or maybe if you're this or that, but they won't ever, ever give a discount if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian. They certainly won't give one if you're a minister. <laughs> no, they don't give any kind of discounts to ministers unless there's like supernatural favor of God. But it is an antichrist system, anti-meeting against. It is a system because Satan is over that system that is against the anointed one, against Christ. So, we have also overcome that through the Lord Jesus Christ. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, the Antichrist system, and also even eventually the Antichrist himself. Now, there, had, there has been the Antichrist spirit within the earth since John penned this letter to the body of Christ. And there have been many throughout the centuries who have desperately wanted and were willing to do anything to be that global world leader. And some uh, made a pretty good run at it. You think about people like Hitler and uh, others. Uh, you know, uh, even before Jesus, you had Alexander the Great. So, but they never, they never could take it all the way. But eventually there will be one that will take it all the way. There'll be a one world government, one world economic world system, uh, one world religion, uh, which is why also the Lord is going to cut the time short. Why? Because things are so wicked. He's going to cut it short. We're going to get this work done. And then when we have brought the harvest in, then the Lord can take us to be with him. And then the Antichrist can have his moment of ruling over all of the wicked who want it to go in that direction. Mm -mm. And there will be a one world religion. Wow. You know, when you don't know history, you do repeat it. It's pretty wild when you see some of the pictures of Hitler when he was in power and you see many of the uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic bishops and many of the Roman Catholic priests doing the Heil, Heil Hitler sign. I mean, it's crazy. And then you see many of the Lutheran ministers doing the Heil Hitler sign. And then you see all kinds of evangelical ministers that were in Germany doing the Heil Hitler sign. <laughs> You're like, what in the world happened to them? Well, uh, they had just bowed to the system and they had compromised. And uh, what a mess, what a disgusting uh, situation to be involved in. But there were those who did not who did not compromise. Some of them lost their lives. Some of them had to go underground in hiding, and some of them had to flee the country. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, overcomes the world system, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, let's go a little slow through this, and we're going to do this on purpose because I think there's some really neat things in here, and this is the victory. Some of you, probably not all of you, um, but I would suspect there's some of you, you're watching and you're listening right now, and you actually have uh, Nike tennis shoes on your feet. 
So when you look through the New Testament, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, which is the common day language of the everyday people. Uh, it's not written in a high, uh, you know, classical, difficult to speak. No, it's the everyday language that everybody spoke. And in the Greek, when it says uh, victory uh, in the English, in the Greek, it is the word Nike. Now, when you bring it over in the English, it's uh, pronounced Nike. But uh, even in, in the Greek, if you were to translate it, it's N-I and then a K-E, but it's pronounced Nike. And that was the Greek goddess of victory. And so if you were to actually read this, it would say, and this is the Nike that has overcome the world. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's basically what a Nike shoe means. Nike uh, was named after the Greek goddess of victory. In other words, it's about winning in sports. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is the victory or the Nike that has overcome the world. So the word Nike can also be translated to conquer. And Let's take a look at this in the book of Revelation. I think it's worth skipping over here. Revelation chapter 2, and go with me to verse 12. Let's talk a little bit more about Nike just for a moment. Uh, verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, the churches that were given these letters by the angel. Uh, these churches are in modern-day Turkey. And when you're looking at Pergamos, uh, we're looking at an ancient city, uh, non-existent. It's all rubble today. But it was back in the mid-1800s when a German architect, excuse me, not architect, archaeologist, came to Turkey, to Pergamum, and began to look around, and we see here that the throne of Satan was there. Well, there was a tremendous temple that was there, and it was known as the Temple of Zeus. And Jesus identifies it as being where Satan had his throne at. And it was a very important city, a key city, because it was a Roman province, and this was a very, very wealthy place, Pergamos. Now, the German archaeologist in the 1850s and into the 1860s found this throne of Satan, and he found this ancient temple. And it had not yet been destroyed like many of the other archaeological sites in Turkey. So uh, he was very excited about it and had funding and basically had a team come over, a very, very large team, and it took them a few years, but they completely disassembled that entire temple, and they and the, they did it with permission from the leader of Turkey at that time, and they moved the whole thing from Turkey all the way to Berlin, Germany. And it's gigantic. Let me put a picture of it up on the screen right now. And Kelly and I, we have been to uh, this temple where the throne of Satan was at. You can actually go up those giant steps. It's the length of a football field, and it has tremendous depth. You can, and they, so they disassembled the whole thing and put it all back together when they got it to Berlin, Germany. And uh, it's uh, very, very eerie. And once it was assembled, it wasn't too long after that that Hitler came to power. My, my goodness. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And so they moved that throne to Berlin, Germany. By the way, in that same museum where Satan's throne is at, there is also a, uh, it's the eighth gate from the Babylon gate structure known as the Gates of Ishtar. And this is where the goddess Ishtar was worshipped. And so, German archaeologists went to Iraq, to Babylon, and they saw the ancient remains of uh, Babylon, and they took, the, there's eight gates, and the one, let me put a picture up, this is the eighth gate. They disassembled it brick by brick, 
and they transported it all the way to Berlin, Germany, and put it back together again. And it is massive. Now, though those gates that you're looking at are literally the gates that the Jews walked through when they were taken into Babylonian captivity. So the Israelites from the southern kingdom were put in shackles after they were defeated, and they were marched as slaves all the way back to Iraq, Babylon, and those are the gates they went into Babylon through. Wow. And uh, it's very interesting because when we look at the gates like a Westerner, you see like a lion and you think, oh, that's cool. And you see kind of like a kind of like a cool dragon looking creature. Those were all demons. Those were all gods or goddesses that were worshipped by the Babylonians. And so there were actually a certain number, I think it was 300 something demonic figures that were on the walls and on the gates of the entrance into Babylon. And so that number corresponds directly to the Hebraic number that means gates of hell. So the captives knew they're going through the gates of hell. And that's why when you see people like Nehemiah and Ezra who came out of that and came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, you have to understand there were a lot of other Jews though, they had gotten so acclimated to Babylon, they never left. They stayed there and just merged into that society and merged into that culture. Well, Let's continue on. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Well, Balak kept trying to get Balaam to curse the people of God. And Balaam, he was a very, very powerful prophet, but he was very compromised in certain areas of his character. And uh, this king, Balak, he had a lot of wealth, and he was always dangling that carrot in front of the prophet and uh, trying to get the people of Israel to be cursed through the prophetic utterance of the prophet. But every time that Balaam would try to speak something uh, maybe against them, a prophecy of blessing would come out. And Balak basically said, I, I give up on you. I, you're, you. You're not doing what I'm telling you to do, and because of that, you're not getting paid either. <laughs> But Balaam said, okay, this is not working the way we plan. God keeps taking over my tongue. So let me tell you how to let me tell you how to get them where they self-defeat themselves and they bring judgment upon themselves. Take a bunch of your women uh, who are all immoral and who worship demons. Introduce those women to the men, particularly when they're away from their wives, when they're out as soldiers on the field. Uh, take the women and introduce them to the men, and you can pull them into sexual immorality, and that will bring all kinds of judgments on them. And guess what? Balak did it, and it worked. But I tell you, later, the Israelites overthrew Balak and his army, and in the battle, Balaam was also killed. So let's continue. Verse 15, Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing Jesus said, I hate. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? It's uh, that name, that identification is made up of two words. And it's the first word is the word Nike. It's the Nike or the, or the Nike Laetans. So Nike means to triumph or to conquer. So it's a triumphing or a victory or you're conquering over the laitans or the laity. So this was an effort of twisted leaders who had compromised their own values in God and in God's word. And they're now going to put that over the, on the laity. They're going to conquer them with what we would consider a spirit of compromise. It's, it's like a compromise like this. Well, brother, you understand that if we want to win them to the Lord, we need to be like them. We need to mingle up 
amongst them, and we need to learn to talk like them. We need to listen to their music, and we need to uh, dress like them, and we need to be like them and uh, drink what they're drinking. And uh, and before you know it, you're you're living the same pagan type life like they are. And so that was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It was a merging with the modern culture, which is always corrupt. And it's saying, well, you know what? Let's do what they're doing. That way we can better relate to them. And maybe uh, this way we could, uh, you know, bring, they'll come to church. And so the spirit of the world ends up coming into the church. And before you know it, there's all forms of pollution and defilement, even amongst God's people. So again, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the Nike, the victory over the laity, which thing I hate. So Jesus hates the spirit of compromise where you're willing to uh, do anything just so that you can fit in to be accepted. You're not willing to stand up and to be the salt and the light because you're afraid that maybe somebody won't like you. Maybe somebody uh, might misunderstand you. <laughs> Does that sound maybe a little bit similar to what the church in the Western world is facing today? Well, my friends, we must be strong and you must really guard your faith and your Christian uh, virtues and your Christian morals and your Christian character. Mm -mm. Praise God. Praise God. Now, now let's go over now to Matthew chapter seven. And I want you to understand that you have world overcoming faith on the inside of you. And as you're turning to Matthew seven, let me just read first uh, John five verse four again, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory. This is the Nike. You're probably never look at a pair of Nike shoes the same ever again. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And that's why I put such an emphasis on faith, because God does. If you want to overcome all of these obstacles, whether it's antichrist spirit, whether it is um, the, the sin uh and the darkness in the world that we're seeing today, you're going to have to do it by faith. That's how they did it in the first century church. And that's how we're going to finish strong. We overcome these things by faith. Now, we want to apply this God type of faith that we have residing on the inside of us as we move forward this year in breakthrough, breakout ways. I'm telling you, uh, I want to talk about this right now. I'm very excited about it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Now, let's, uh, let's slow down as we go through this verse. I know that most of you have heard it before, and you've probably have heard good sermons on it. But we're in a season right now where I think some still think that there's not a way forward because you've tried and you couldn't find what you were looking for. Maybe the key or maybe how to do it. Now, let's look at it. Verse 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. So let's go over now to the Amplified Version and take a look at it in the Amplified Bible. And this is what it says, and it's going to bring out more fully the original Greek meaning. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. So I have a feeling by the leading of the Spirit that some of you, you've tried, but you've been told no. And then you took an extra effort because you're a child of God and you have faith on the inside of you. And then you took another effort, but then again, somebody else told you no. And maybe that's when you just decided perhaps it's not meant to be. Perhaps I don't have the faith that takes or whatever it might be. But really, this is more of persistence where you just keep at it because you're going to get 
your breakthrough. So ask, praise the Lord, praise God. This could be in many different areas. You know, I was at the dentist last year and I was just curious because, you know, I've heard different opinions. So I asked the dentist and I asked his wife who worked at the dentist office. I said, now, I said, y'all do this for a living, so tell me what you think. Is it possible to restore enamel on teeth, and is it it possible to uh, restore and build out new gum tissue? And they both said no. The the dentist said, oh, no. And his wife was very adamant. Oh, no, that once you lose enamel, you can't get it back. If if you brush your teeth too much, you you can brush it all off. And that, that is true. You can really damage your teeth. A lot of people have done that trying to get their teeth whiter and they just keep brushing and brushing and what they're doing is removing the enamel <laughs> because um, your teeth are porous and so you you basically have to like bleach them or whatever it might be while also not drinking or eating things that can stain them. But uh, they said, no, you, you cannot regenerate enamel and you certainly cannot regenerate new gum tissue. It, if it recedes, you know, you, you're, that's just what happens and you can't do anything about it. I said, well, I've heard, I said, oh, no, 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 you can't do anything about it. And I, I'm sure that any dentist would be pretty uh, much in that flow, no matter what, what dentist you're going to ask, because after all, if you could restore enamel naturally and you could find ways to uh, heal your gums. They, be, you know, they would go back. That means the dentist is not going to have as much business. So they're not really invested into seeking a solution for that problem. But sometimes you just want to know, maybe for overall health and maybe because you want a better smile, praise God. So of course, you can go on the YouTube and there are even dentists that will say, yes, you can absolutely regenerate new enamel on your teeth. Yes, you can absolutely regenerate new gum tissue. It will grow. (laughs) Now, of course, there is uh, a knowledge base that's behind that, things that you should do, things that you should not do, so that you can get that going in the right direction. But I'm just telling you that sometimes people ask, and somebody says, oh, no, you can't do that. But that's just, maybe it's their opinion. Oh, yes, but Pastor Stephen, they're an expert. Well, that still doesn't mean they're right. Woo, praise God. And I've seen people that say you can do it that even have proof that, yes, we applied it to this person. Now they've got all kinds of new enamel growing in their teeth. And here's, let's go even further. I've heard stories of people who have had, who've lost all of their teeth Oh, well, now, now a dentist is going to say, now we need to send you over here so that you can get dentures. But I've seen many, many cases where people have had a brand new set of teeth grow back in. Oh, now, Pastor Stephen, that's medically impossible. Well, I've seen pictures of it, and I've heard proof after proof of it. So really, you know, I'm just telling you, ask. Keep on asking, because if you just ask a few people, then they may be sincere, but they may not know. Maybe they're not up to speed. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Just keep asking around. Mm. Ask around. Here's what I heard. Years back, I heard this. There's no way to buy a home unless you have a 20% down payment. You just can't do it, Pastor Stephen. Let me tell you right now, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. There's, there are some lenders that will allow you to buy a home even if all you have is 5% down. And I'm not talking about 5% down and outrageous interest to offset that. Though I've, I've seen some crazy, crazy deals. But the fact that people say you can't do it, it's like it almost guarantees that there is a way that you can do it. There's got to be other ways. Maybe they're not traditional. Maybe they're a little bit unorthodox. But yeah, there's absolutely workarounds. Well, Pastor Stephen, I can never own a home. I can't pull together a 20% down payment. No, there's a way. There's a way. There's a workaround. And first of all, I believe God can give you the 20% down payment if you want to go that route. But let's say that maybe you're just thinking, oh, I can't. Well, then there's other options. 
Well, what are they, Pastor Stephen? Well, I've already got my home. I already own a home. So I, I, but I'm telling you, they're out there. You need to explore them. There's all kinds of different options. I remember one time my wife and I, we saw a real beautiful home for sale in Moravian Falls. I mean, it was like a, it's a log cabin, great view, uh, and in a great community, absolutely beautiful, and it was for sale. And I thought, oh, wow, that, this was years back. I thought, wow, that would be a great home. I said, Kelly, if we could buy that home, that'd be so cool. And uh, we found out what the price was, and we just said, oh, no, well, you know, it's not, go it's not going to happen. So uh, it was nice, it must be a beautiful home. And so like, uh, like three weeks went by, and we heard that the home sold. And the home sold, are you ready for this? I don't, I don't know if some of you are ready for this. You might need to sit down. I'm going to take a drink of tea. You, you need to get ready for this one. <laughs> oh, there's no way, Pastor Stephen. Get ready for this one. There was a young lady that moved in the town, single lady. I don't even know if she had a job or not. I don't think she even had a job at that time. She saw that the home was for sale, went up to the house, which I never did, knocked on the door. The owner of the house opened up the door and said, yes, can I help you? She said, well, I see that the, your beautiful home is for sale. He said, yes, it is. She said, would you sell it to me with owner financing? He said, you know what? I think I'll do it. And he did it. Well, Pastor Steve, that's not, that's not fair. That, ask. Ask. Who told you you can't do that? Well, you're not supposed to. She did it. She owns the home. It's been maybe 15 years. No, hold on. She, that was right before 2008, maybe like 2007. And so she's been in that home, uh, what is that, 17 years or something like that. Owned in her own home and nobody else says, you can't, uh, yeah, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of stuff out there. If you'll just have faith and ask and ask, Something, something is going to happen for you. But see, there's faith in the asking. Oh, why, why, try, why even try, Pastor Stephen? There's no way. No, you keep your faith on. Look, this is how you overcome the world. You're going to do it with your faith. But I need to let you know that you're probably going to have to do some asking along the journey. <laughs> because it may not all just line up perfectly. And you're going to have to ask. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Lord. Ask. Well, they, they gave me a quote, Pastor Stephen. It's just way, too, way, way too high. Get another quote. Well, no, no, no. That, that quote is accurate. How, how do you know? If you don't have another one, how do you know that quote is accurate? Well, they're professionals. Maybe they're charging you a professional price. Mm -hmm. Now, when a contractor pulls up in a brand new, beautiful vehicle, and you can tell that they're making a lot of money, uh, that does bring a sense of they obviously must be good because it looks like they're, you know, making money. So that, that's good. But the smart contractors, and I know them, the ones that are running multi-million dollar construction businesses, it doesn't matter if they're bidding on a job that's worth millions of dollars. They pull up in an old pickup truck. Because there's a, there's a wisdom where you want to hide that wealth because if they know you're wealthy, they're thinking, he's got the extra. So we're going to pad this quote just for them. So maybe you got a quote, but maybe they looked you over and they thought, because they're smart, maybe they thought, you know what? Let's stick them a little bit high because they can pay it. They can pay the price. So you got a professional quote and uh, it could be on the upper end of the spectrum. And so you may need to call some other people. I would highly encourage you to do that so that you can find out sometimes not even what a good quote is, but maybe you can get a favorable quote where God touches it. And not only is the quote right, the people doing the work are right. And now, now the next thing you know, you're unstuck and you're moving forward. But it never, never, never would have happened if you hadn't have asked. And I'm not just talking about praying. There's a place for that. And, uh, but you've got to use your faith uh, and get out there and, and ask, hey, can you give me a quote on this? Yeah, I'll come by and do that tomorrow. Good, I'll be here. Come on over. Mm -hmm. hide, hide your wealth. Not because you're embarrassed of it. 
If they're going to come over and give you a quote, don't pull up in your fancy car with a three-piece suit. <laughs> you got to dial that down. Dial that down. They can find out who you are later, okay? <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord. See, there's a lot of people. The moment for me, the moment with me, if they find out I'm a, pre, a TV preacher, they think, oh, he's got money. He, he's on TV. We're going to stick it to him. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> I'll get a hundred quotes, but you ain't going to stick it to me, brother. Mm-mm. Praise God. Go stick it to some sinner, but you're not going to stick it to me. We're too tight and too smart with God's money. Mm-mm. If you're going to pad your bill, you're not going to pay it with me because I won't, I won't give you the job. Now, I'm going to want a good job done. Praise the Lord. But uh, we're going to get a deal. We're going to get a deal on this. Praise God. It's going to be a win-win for both parties. Mm-mm. All right. Ask. And keep on asking. Keep on asking. Mm-mm. Okay, you ready for the next one? Seek. Seek. Why? Why should we keep trying? Because there's always an answer. There's always, always a way out. There's always a way to solve this goofy, silly thing that has not departed your life when it probably was supposed to be booted out a couple of years ago. Well, my, my wife and I owned a home, and it was a real blessing. God got us into this home. It was a miracle how we got into it. Uh, but once we got into it, and you go, that comes with ownership, we inherited a few challenges with that home. Uh, one of the challenges was something about the, the way that the water would not run off the house properly. And it was tricky because it looked like it was sloped properly, but yet... The basement was always damp. I mean, you could put your hand on their cinder walk, uh, cinder block walls of the basement. It'd be damp. There was one section. It was just damp, 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 wet, damp all the time. And sometimes it would get more damp and other times less damp. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that could be working with that. There could be uh, you know, could be uh, you know, it rained a lot and now the water's pooling in a certain area. But I tried all types of things to, you know, I'll give you an example. When we bought the home, uh, it did not have gutters. So I thought, all right, I'm going to put gutters on the house, run the water off. That's going to fix the problem. And not only was I running the uh, water off the gutters, but connected to the gutter would be the spill pipe. And then you run that off and then it goes off, uh, off to the side somewhere. And it still didn't fix it. Still damp basement all the time. Damp basement all the time. And that went on for about two years, and I didn't know how to fix it. But one day, one day, my wife and I, we had Sister Carolyn over, a spirit-filled, tongue-talking, prophetic uh, realtor, and she buys and sells homes. And I said, she was visiting us one day, and just before she left, we are standing outside in the front yard, I said, Carolyn, I said, can I ask you a question? See, because I'm seeking. There's got to be a solution. Uh, and, and I said, she said, what, what do you want to know? I said, Carolyn, I've got a continual damp basement, and I don't know how to fix it. I've got some drainage problems or something going on. Okay, now, I want you to, uh, here we go on another wild one. Now, I had one person, before I tell you what Sister Carolyn told me, I had a contractor come out. And I said, can you tell me how to fix my wet basement, about my damp basement and this whatever's going on here? Are you ready for this one? Get, get ready for, for uh, crazy land. Woo! This contractor told me, he said, I can fix it. I said, how much will it cost? He said, I'm going to give you a good deal. There's going to be quite a bit of work in here. I said, how much? He said, $35,000. I said, $35,000? He said, yeah. He said, I've got to take your whole back deck off. I've got to, I've got to level and lower the whole back field where they filled in the back area of the, uh, uh, the back side of your house. I've got to remove all of that. I've got to cut, I've got to cut into the cement of your slab floor in the in the foundation basement. I've got to put drain pipes in there. I said, $35,000. He said, yep. He said, I'll fix it, and you'll never have the problem again. And uh, I said, thank you for your time. 
I'll think about it. I thought about it for one second. I thought, ain't, 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 ain't it going to happen? It ain't going to happen. Well, he left, and I never, I never called him back. I thanked him for his time, but I also thought he doesn't know what he's talking about, and I'm not going to be the guinea pig. I'm not going to be the $35,000 guinea pig of how he tries to figure this problem out. Ask, seek. Why? There's a solution. All right. Okay. So sister Carolyn, the tongue talking Pentecostal prophetic vision scene realtor comes over. And I said, uh, sister Carolyn, before you leave, I've got some kind of a damp basement drainage problem. What would you suggest? She said, Stephen, do this, do this and run it over here and do that. Put this French drain right here. You'll be good to go. I said, that's it. She said, yeah. Are you ready for this one? I did exactly what she said. Hired the worker, did all that. $475. Fixed forever. It fixed it forever. Would you rather pay $475 and fix it or pay some goofball $35,000 and almost all of that's going in his pocket? And he just moves some dirt and he messes it around and then probably still didn't fix it. Matter of fact, what he said he was going to do never touched the main area that Carolyn said, this is where your problem's at right here. He never even mentioned that. Can you imagine paying $35,000 and the problem is still there? Mm -mm. Carolyn told me what to do. $475 later, it's gone and it fixed it forever. And then after that, we sold the home. Mm-hmm. Pastor Steve, I just give up. I quit. I want out. I'm going to sell the home. Don't sell the home. I knew in my heart, don't you sell that home until you fix it. Don't pass that problem on to somebody else until you Nike it, until you conquer it and you win it. Pastor Stephen, that Nike is only for football and sports. Nike's in the Bible. God wants you to have victory in life. God wants you to win. Pastor Stephen, we're all wieners. No, not a wiener, a winner. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody needs to go out and just buy a pair of Nike shoes. Maybe you don't even like Nike. Maybe you don't even want to wear them, but just buy a pair and put it on your wall so you can look at them and say, I'm supposed to be a winner, not a loser. Mm-hmm. Pastor Stephen, it whipped me. It defeated me. Seek. Keep asking questions. Keep seeking for a solution, and you're going to get it. You're going to find it. And it's probably... It's probably gonna the thing, it's probably gonna blow your mind when you get it because it'll probably be a whole lot easier than what you thought. Oh no, Pastor Stephen, you don't know my situation. My situation is so complex and so convoluted that not even NASA could fix it. No, no, no. It's probably way, way easier than what you're thinking. Ask and seek. Mm-mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Look, we only know what we know, but there's somebody else that knows something that you and I don't know, (laughs) which is why you need to seek. Seek out those that are uh, knowledgeable in their field. Seek out those, sometimes not so much that have all of the credentials, but actually have the proofs, actually have the results, not the theories, but the results. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Most of our problems, the solutions that we're seeking, uh, because the problems are wisdom related, the solutions are in the realm of wisdom, not other areas. I'll give you an example. I had an email. I get quite a few of them. I had an email this week. Pastor Stephen, I'm a pastor uh, from a certain place, and we're having some money problems in our church and we cannot pay the rent, and we are, we have fallen behind quite a few months on the rent. Would you and your ministry please pay the rent so that we can get caught up? And once we're caught up, I'm sure these problems won't happen again. Well, I didn't answer the email. Why? Because what that pastor is dealing with is not a money problem, although he is having a money problem. But that's not the real problem. That is a, that's the fruit of, of the problem. The real problem is deeper. There's a wisdom deficiency somewhere. He's got a wisdom problem. 
Because this is what happens. Let's say you pay, oh, Pastor Steve, I'm going to jump in and pay his rent. Okay, this is what happens. You jump in and pay his rent and bail him out. And then four months later, I know what's going to happen. Another email is going to come in. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, uh, we have fallen back behind again, and we need you to rise up and let God flow through you again. No, 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 no. no. Fix it at the root. Don't put a Band-Aid over it. Fix it at the root. There's a wisdom problem. Did you did you rent a, a place that's too big and too expensive? Did you, maybe you're small and you tried to bite off more than you can chew and you've got 200 members, but you rented a place for a thousand and now you're, you're struggling, you've overextended yourself. Uh, see, it's a wisdom problem. And if you just pour money on it, the problem doesn't go away. Why? There's still no wisdom that's functioning. So ask and Seek. Mm, mm, mm. Praise the Lord. So I offer wisdom. Wisdom's free of charge. <laughs> Pray, praise the Lord. Now, will people implement it? I don't always know. A lot of times they don't, they don't even want to know wisdom. They just want money. Give me the money and I'll leave you alone. No, no, no. Praise God. Mm, mm, mm. Praise the Lord. Let's do things the right way. I'm not opposed to helping people. And I'm not opposed to um, uh, showing mercy to people, but we uh, we have to do things the right way. There's a lot of, uh, I call it unsanctified giving that takes place in the body of Christ where people give solely because they're being moved by emotions. And now they're sowing into something that's not even good soil. And they're not going to get a return on the seed that they've sown and it's, it's not the way to operate in the kingdom. Let's do things the right way. Ask and seek. By the way, these denote humility. If you think you know it all, you won't ask. If you think you've got it all figured out, you won't seek. So there is an element of us humbling ourselves and worshiping the Lord, thanking Him for His wisdom, and also knowing that oftentimes, uh, because we are a body, there are other parts of the body that can have a solution that we're looking for. So keep on asking and keep on seeking. Mm -mm. Thank you, Lord. And let's go to the last one. Knock and keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. You know, I was thinking about, well, let's look at it just for a moment. This is Acts chapter 10. Let me turn over there. Acts chapter 10. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is showing you some things to do to move forward. Acts 10, verse 1, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So he was a man of prayer and he was a giver. And by doing that, he created a divine response. So there was a cumulative effect of just praying and praying and praying and giving and giving and giving until something was released from heaven. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and basically giving him a supernatural message. Praise God. So you need to knock. And sometimes when you're knocking, in a sense, that's what Cornelius was doing, praying, 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 giving, giving, giving. That will pre create or produce a cumulative effect of knocking on heaven's door. And that door will open. Even if you don't realize that that's an act of knocking, it is. And if you keep knocking because you're wanting a door to open, it's going to eventually open for you as long as you keep doing your part. I would say that you should pray about what doors you really want to open in your life. Because we're not just knocking to have a door open for fun. Say, oh, that was cool. But no, when something's really on your heart and you want to step into something, in other words, you want to go through a door and step into something and stand somewhere that you're not currently standing, you have to keep knocking. And that shows hunger and persistence much like the widow woman in Luke chapter 18, who just kept going before the unjust judge until the judge said, you know what? This woman is 
wearying me with her constant coming, constant letter writing, constant emails. I'm just going to go ahead and give her what she wants just to get her off of my back. And Jesus said that when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith like that in the earth? Real faith where you just stay with it knowing there's got to be a way forward. So you keep asking, you keep seeking, and you keep knocking. But the asking, seeking, and knocking are done in faith. They're done knowing that God's going to open a door, and he will. Maybe you want more of the supernatural in your life. So you get up early in the morning, and maybe you just sit in a chair and just speak in tongues for an hour. No English, just tongues. Lord, I'm going to go for it. I don't even, maybe you don't even really understand it all, but you're just going to sit in a chair with your Bible close by and a pen and a paper in case God gives you something to write down. And um, you just take off. And you do it for an hour. Solely out of a heart where you're seeking for more of God and you're looking for a door to begin to open. And when that door to the supernatural opens, what do you do? You lean into it. You begin to go through that door. How? By faith. Woo, praise God. And before you know it, I, you can get into that realm. I have found that it's like riding a bicycle, that once you learn to ride a bicycle, you've always got it. That, that memory within the muscle system of balance and rhythm Uh, Even if you don't get on a bike for the next five years, you haven't forgotten. You can get back on a bike and look at that. You can still ride it. Once you go through that door of the supernatural and you've had a visionary experience, you've had a valid, genuine experience with God, there is something about that. It's like riding a bike. You you know how that operates now. You know how that works so you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, Uh, it can begin to happen again. And then you begin to really walk with God like Enoch did. But what does that require? Knocking, knocking to break into that realm, to come into a place, to come into a place financially through sowing where you've never been there before, but you keep knocking on that door, just like Cornelius praying, giving, praying, giving, praying and giving, which is in a sense, knocking on heaven's door. And God responded, And a memorial was established in heaven because of that man's righteous acts. So asking, seeking, and knocking. And basically, you're just saying, "Uh, Lord, I've been told no, but I can't take no for an answer. They have told me no, but I know with you, this this is the destiny that you have for me. So I just thank you that you're going to show me how to still get to where I'm supposed to go. And he will. And sometimes it might come through methods and means that others were not even aware of, but you'll have your own testimony. You know, Prophet Kenneth Hagin, many years back, he talked about how he bought his first home, and it was it was really like very unorthodox. And then he talked about how he bought his second home, and he said all of the homes he bought were that way. Would you believe that in the life of Kelly and I, every home that we've bought— it was the same way that Kenneth Hagin got his homes. Mm-mm. Same way. Same exact way. Woo, praise the Lord. <laughs> Unorthodox, non-traditional, but we own our home, praise God. And God can do it for you. But you have to ask, seek. It might be a little bit of a different type thing of how God takes you. Everybody's journey is different. Everybody's journey will have a different testimony. But God is with you, and God's going to help you do it. Praise God. Lift your hands. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for those that are watching. Many have been given uh, maybe a denial. Maybe they were told no. Maybe they were told there's no more seats. Maybe they were told there's no more room. Maybe there was a rejection of a legal document that they so desperately needed and wanted to get stamped off and approved. But I thank you, Father, for every no, that there's always somebody higher up that has the ability to change or override or stamp it yes. So I just thank you, Father God, as they revisit what would look like something that's stuck. I thank you that you're going to give them a breakthrough as they ask and seek and knock, as they send another email, as they call another person, as they try again, something's going to happen. Father, let it open. They're doing their part. 
I thank you they're going to see that Jesus was telling an amazing truth that if we ask, we receive. If we seek, we find. If we knock the door, it really will open. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now say, I'm going to get it done. Say it again. Say, I'm going to get it done. Mm -mm. Yes, you are. Now, if you don't know Jesus, it's time for you to get your life right with God. I want to lead you in a prayer so that you can make your peace with God and so that you can gain heaven and miss out on hell. Right now, right now, pray this prayer after me. If you don't know Christ, just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all of my sins. Please forgive me. Wash me clean with your precious blood. Jesus, write my name in your book of life and step into my life today and lead me and guide me from this day forward. Jesus, thank you for saving me. In your name I pray, amen. And amen. Woo, praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The fire of God is here today. Let's take Holy Communion together. I want to encourage you to grab some unleavened bread, grab a little cracker, grab some grape juice, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. Through this prayer, we bless it, and we set it apart as being holy. And this is now the body and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you for miracles. We thank you, Father God, we're going to do our part. We're going to push. We're not just going to sit back and say, well, that, that didn't work out. No, Lord, if you're in it, we're going to stick with it. And we thank you for the principles of asking and seeking and knocking. Thank you, Father. There's, there's a way coming. There's a door opening. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody's problem is about to get solved. Let's receive the Lord's body. Maybe somebody's thinking, I can't figure out why I haven't gotten married yet. Hmm. Well, maybe there's something that you don't know. Praise the Lord. That you need to know. And that one thing could be the thing that makes a major difference. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I mean, if a fisherman's fishing with the lure and it's just not catching anything, maybe he can change the bait a little bit because the fish like the scent of the bait. Praise God. Maybe the scent is wrong. Mm -mm. You know, the Holy Spirit could tell you what perfume to wear. If you're a lady, you're trying to catch a spirit-filled man, the Holy Spirit can help you pick the right perfume that that person that you're going to meet will like. Mm -mm. Praise God. Mm -mm. And vice versa. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Would you believe? I don't know if I should tell this. I actually put it in my book, but I think people read it in my book and they can't quite grasp it. But would you believe in a vision, a face-to-face -face talk that I had with Jesus Christ, the head of the church, who appeared to me in a vision. And he, and he, uh, he mentioned to me about women that are single that want to get married, and he talked about how these women don't wear perfume, yet they want to get married. Can, can you believe a woman who was, is single and would want to get married and does not even wear perfume? Can you believe Jesus told me that? Mm -mm. He actually told me that. <laughs> like it's like it's like crazy. <laughs> like you say you have faith. Well, if you've got faith, you, how come you're not even wearing perfume? Mm -mm. Mm. There was a perfume that Cleopatra wore that they said that was so phenomenal that it was almost like it would almost like make guys pass out. It was so Phenomenal. Now that 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 um, whatever it was was lost. It came from a plant. They say that plant has now gone extinct. But I will say this: there are some things out there that'll make your head spin. There is one perfume that a designer in France. He's probably the world's best. 
He created this one perfume for women that he, he called it his masterpiece. I mean, it would like make a man's head spin. And uh, it was like his most amazing creation. And so, uh, so you know, he released it and, uh, you know, a major perfume company picked up on it and it sold all over the world. And so he said he was on an international flight because he lived in Paris. And I think he was flying to America. So he got stuck on this long international flight and there was a lady sitting next to him and he's sitting in his chair and he starts to smell this most mind-boggling fragrance. And then he realizes it's his. It's the one he created. And the woman sitting next to him is wearing it. He goes, well, um, I... Uh, I can tell that you're wearing the so-and-so fragrance. She said, yes, it's my, fra my favorite fragrance in the world. She said, I made it my signature scent. She said, it's the only one I wear. He said, well, I'm the one who created it. She goes, oh. She goes, well, I love it. And he said, I had to sit there for 10 hours and basically be like bugged by it. <laughs> Seek, ask, seek not. There's something that you don't know that somebody else does. And that sometimes just knowing that one thing can unlock, can unlock the answer. Yes, Pastor Stephen, I need to launch into a 40 day fast. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Woo. Maybe, maybe, maybe the whole thing revolves around a $45 bottle of $45 bottle of perfume. <laughs> Woo. What, not a 40 day fast. Isn't that simple? That, that's too easy, Pastor Stephen. Wisdom is usually very simple. Mm -mm. All right, Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. It's mighty cleansing power. Thank you, Father God. We give you praise. We give you praise for long life and health and a whole lot of joy. Thank you, O oh God, for the blood of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive. Woo! Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it will be open. Now, my friends, we are getting very close to March 31st, Resurrection, Sunday morning. And on that day, around the world, we celebrate that day that Christ arose from the dead. The tomb is forever empty. And on Friday, God gave his best, and Jesus laid his life down and was raised from the dead on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. So, because God gave his best, we honor Resurrection Day as being the day that we also give our best. I want to encourage you to sow a very special seed on Sunday, March 31st, Resurrection Sunday. I want to encourage you to do something special so that here at the ministry, we can move through some very special doors that God has called us to step through. Woo! Hallelujah. And I want to encourage you to get your seed in either on that day or any time before that day. So we've got a few more days. If you need a few more days to get it pulled together, that's fine. But I want to pray over your offering, your resurrection offering, that that thing that you desire God to do in your life, that he'll reach into your life and he'll see your seed and he will grant a beautiful harvest to you. And your giving, of course, helps the ministry here to move forward and do amazing things that bring glory to God and that strengthen and build up God's people all over the world. I will be looking uh, for your resurrection love offering seed. And I want to put up on the screen right now ways that you can give. You can mail your offering in uh, here. And if you would like, you can also bring it in online, whatever is easiest for you to do. You can go to the ministry website, stephenbrooks.org, the link at the top, give online. Click on that. It'll say tithes and offerings, and that'll take you to the giving page. There's a drop-down menu where it says fund, F-U-N-D. Click that. There's the drop-down menu, and you'll see resurrection offering. Woo! Praise God. Praise God. And I really believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life, something that makes you smile, makes you laugh, makes you dance. And when you sow your seed, I just want you to begin to praise the Lord because he sees your heart 
and he's going to give you a breakthrough. I really believe that. I'm praying over every offering that's coming in. I want to say thank you for giving. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for praying for us so that we can go through these amazing doors. Praise God. Good things going on. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Once uh, some things are solidified, signed, sealed, delivered, as we would say. Okay. Thank you for your support. Now, you have some asking, some seeking, and some knocking to do. Revisit some things that were maybe put in stuck mode. Revisit them. They're about to get seriously unstuck. Okay. Heavenly Father, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next time. Thank you also for sowing your resurrection seed.